Hello and welcome to a special two-part note in which we're going to be discussing this book, The Dollar Trap. It's a fascinating account which suggests that the US dollar might maintain its status as the world's re reserve currency even as ever more horrible things happen to the US economy. It's created a great deal of interest in the world of central banks. So now let's talk to the author. He's the professor of economics at Cornell University, Ishwar Prasad. Ishwar, thank you very much for joining me in London today. Let's start by taking a look at the uh, value of the dollar over the last decade or so. And uh, as you can see, uh, there was an obviously inexorable decline for many years, but then a, a very sharp recovery just as uh, the US ran into the credit crisis and the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. Counterintuitive to say the least. What do you think happened? This is the remarkable thing about what's been happening to the, to the dollar since the financial crisis. Mm. When the financial crisis hit, and every time since then when there is financial turmoil anywhere in the world, in the Eurozone, in emerging markets, or, and this is the great paradox, in the US itself, money mm. comes to the US in search of safety. So I think this speaks to the enormous demand for safety from central banks, private investors, and financial institutions in the wake of the financial crisis. And when people want mm. safety, they have no other place to go. Okay, now let's take a look at where the, uh, at, uh, the flows of money again. Uh, you can see this remarkable uh, shift upwards in the flows in 08 or 09. What other alternatives do they have? Really not much as this chart shows. Since the uh, financial crisis hit the US economy, the amount of publicly traded debt uh, issued by the US government has been about $5.7 trillion. So that's excluding what's been bought by, by, the, uh, by the Fed. By the, the Fed and rates. other parts of the US right. government. Right. And as you can see, the blue bars show that a lot of this uh, debt issued by the US has in fact been financed by foreign investors, including foreign central banks. So nearly 60% of the publicly traded debt issued by the US government since 2007 has been bought by foreign investors, which suggests that foreign investors, when they look for safety, still don't see much of an alternative to the US dollar. And is there anything to the notion that, that there's less of an alternative than there used to be? I, for example, the euro, uh, obviously, for, for, for clear reasons, might be less of an attractive alternative reserve currency than it once was. The AAA paper that was stamped on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac similarly may not look quite so appealing anymore. Is it the case that supply is actively reduced at the same time as demand is increased for safety. This is one of the key arguments I make in the book mm. that while the demand for safety has increased enormously since the financial crisis, the supply of safe assets has shrunk. As you pointed out, the Eurozone doesn't seem to be quite what we thought it was. And in fact, if you think about the safe part of the Eurozone, the core Eurozone economies, those account for only about 40% of Eurozone government debt. And even that includes countries like Austria and France that have had downgrades of their debt. Japan and Switzerland don't want money coming into their economies. So mm. they've become net demanders rather than suppliers of safe assets. So who's there to fill in the gap? The US. So it's, ultimately there, there just is nobody else. Let's take a look finally at uh, exactly who those foreign holders are. It's not um, the, 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 uh, the uh, international investors are by far the biggest chunk of, uh, of, of money holding on to, to, to government bonds. I mean, do you think that, that proportion will increase over time? Now, this is the remarkable thing. The U.S. stands out in this dimension. Mm. Again, if you set aside the amount of U.S. federal debt held by other parts of the U.S. government, including the Social Security Trust Funds mm. and the Fed, which now holds about $2 trillion, mm. the remainder, about $10.2 trillion worth of publicly traded debt, $5.8 trillion of that is held by foreign investors, about $4 trillion as foreign central banks. Mm. That proportion, about 55%, is much greater than other economies. In Japan's case, about 11% right. of net debt is held by foreign investors. In the case of the Eurozone, about 20%. So the trust that the rest of the world seems to have in the U.S. seems to be growing by the day. Okay, now that leads perhaps to the, the, the question which will be on, on many lips. Is there not some kind of tipping point. We are all of us by default putting an immense trust in the US. They appear to be taking advantage of that to, to uh, indulge in um, policies that many people would regard as inflationary. Could there become a point when we lose that trust? Logically, yes, because after all, the US has been issuing a lot of debt 
creating a lot of uh, um, money through the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing operations. But the funny thing is every time the U.S. comes to the brink in terms of the debt ceiling or when the U.S. has a downgrade on its debt as happened with Standard mm -hmm. & Poor's, money comes into the U.S. dollar. I mean, it's sort of unprecedented that when an economy has a downgrade of its government debt, people come to exactly that same government debt which is in danger of default for safety. And uh, recently we've had notions of China, Russia perhaps dumping their U.S. government bonds. They really have no other place to go. Once you start talking in the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, no other markets are deep enough to absorb that amount of money. Ishma, thank you very much indeed. I think we are left with a clear conclusion that whether we like it or not, we all are trusting in the U.S. simply because there is no alternative. Next time I'd like to talk to Ishwar about another very great paradox of uh, the world of capital flows, which is why capital flows from poor countries to rich and not, as theory would predict, the other way around.